Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started. I'm Anita Huberman, I'm CEO of the Surrey Board of Trade, and welcome to the 2020 Economic Forecast Lunch, featuring our very special guest all the way from Montreal, Quebec, Mr. Pierre Claroux of BDC Business Development Bank of Canada. Let's give him a great Surrey welcome. So much to BDC for bringing him to Surrey, British Columbia. Surrey, as you know, is where it's an opportunity city. We're going to be the largest city in British Columbia very soon. And uh, the other thing I wanted to also mention that's very important in Surrey is we have the highest urban Aboriginal population in British Columbia. That's why at each and every event, we acknowledge the land on which we gather, which is the traditional and unceded territory of our Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Kwantlen KC, Simiamu, and Tawasin First Nations. And ladies and gentlemen, I, as you know, sponsors make Surrey Board of Trade events, so without sponsors, our 100 plus events simply would not take place. All of our events are meant to be city building events, uh, to grow the economy, to instigate change, uh, to invoke new ideas. Uh, so please help me thank, our, again, our speaker sponsor, BDC, our media sponsor, the Surrey Now Leader Media Group, and the Business and International Trade Center sponsor. So anyone who's starting a business, needs business support, is looking for global business connections, you come to the Surrey Board of Trade, to our Business and Trade Center. And it is sponsored by the accounting firm of PwC, the law firm of Baskin, and the Chambers of Commerce Group Insurance Plan, represented by SNF Benefits. A round of applause. For And I'd like to welcome some uh, guests that are in the audience. Uh, please hold your applause until I've called all of them. Uh, Mr. Jagru Rar, MLA for Surrey Fleetwood. Stephanie Cadu, MLA for Surrey South. Tracy Reddy, MLA for Surrey White Rock, representing her is Debbie Ward. At Marvin Hunt, MLA for Surrey Cloverdale. John Martin, MLA for Chilliwack. City of Surrey Councillor Stephen Pettigrew, City of Surrey Councillor Brenda Locke, and Gary Timothchuk, Surrey School Trustee. Thank you so much for attending. <laughs> and I'd also like to welcome our board directors for the Surrey Board of Trade. They are re uh, really focused on uh, the future focus for the City of Surrey and for the Surrey Board of Trade. Please help me welcome our board chair, CEO of Unity, Mr. Doug Tennant. <laughs> I'm gonna get you to hold your applause while I uh, announce the rest of them. Our Vice Chair, Belgie Dollywall of Tinker's Tax and Accounting, and he's also the chair of the Board of Trade's Youth Entrepreneur Team. Rory Morgan from the law firm of Hamilton Duncan, chair of our Transportation Team. John Mitchner from the Port of Bellingham. Now, Green Mohammed from BDC. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, the Board of Trade is uh, has six thousand business contacts as our as our membership base. That represents over three thousand member businesses, sixty thousand employees. And we believe that transportation and education are the foundation of driving our economy. And really, that's why last year we released the first ever Surrey Labor Market Study and Surrey Workforce Strategy up until 2029. And in that document, what came out over and over again is the continued need to ensure that our businesses are supported uh, long term and short term, that there are transportation investments uh, in our city and there are partnerships between all levels of government uh, to ensure that Surrey remains an opportunity city. And so I wanted to turn your attention to documents that are at each of your place settings and that is the release of the 2020 Surrey Road Survey. 
And I'm just going to indicate some of the results. Uh, emails were sent out earlier this morning to our membership and to media. The full report is on our website. It's about a 25-page report. Uh, but I'm just going to mention uh, some highlights uh, for you. So close to 40% of our respondents identified as employers. The rest were employees. Uh, really, the highlights that people wanted was to widen on and off ramps of bridges, plan all major infrastructure projects that anticipate the needs and that results in infrastructure construction well in advance of increased demand, not long after the capacity is exceeded. Common sense. And three, that all levels of government work together to develop an inter-regional transit and transportation plan for the South Fraser economic region, and one that would not be subject to political interference, but based on best transportation practices. Really, uh, just uh, some other highlights that I wanted to mention, the daily commute in Surrey, 53% of respondents uh, live and work in Surrey, um, just uh, over 20% work in Surrey but live south of the Fraser, and 92% uh, drive their own vehicle to work. That's up from last year's uh, results. Traveling for business, uh, just over 22% drive two to three days per week. Uh, that's down from 40% in 2016, for example. And only 10% of our population uh, within those that uh, completed the survey rarely drive. So we are absolutely a vehicle car culture. Our travel destinations, 20% travel within Surrey. 51% travel throughout the South Fraser. And over 50% travel throughout Metro Vancouver for work purposes. Our employee travel, over 45% of respondents estimated that 20% of their colleagues traveled for business. That's up. Uh, top three corridors requiring attention. Over 52% wanted the Fraser Highway to be increased to five lanes between Wally Boulevard and 148th Street through Green Timbers Park. 53% support South Surrey Highway 99 interchanges. 43% want 152 Street widened to four lanes from 40th to 50th Avenue. Congestion costs business. That's why transportation is something that we focus on so significantly. The top choice for road connections, over 64% prioritize a 20th Avenue overpass a new Highway 99 overpass with improvements to 152. Top three intersections that require attention by the city, over 40%, 64 Avenue and 168th Street. 31%, uh, 24 Avenue and 156th Street. And over 32% want improvements again on Fraser Highway and 184. Transit is needed. That was really the clear message. 66% rated rapid transit on Fraser Highway, city center to Langley, uh, definitely needed. 66% respondents determined that later bus service on select routes definitely needed. And over 63% believe that new bus service to neighborhoods are not served by transit within our city. Safety is also important to those that responded in the survey. The traffic fatalities and serious injuries could be prevented. Ride sharing, absolutely a priority. People wanted ride sharing services in Surrey. Bike sharing, people are looking for alternative ways to get around. And bridges, absolutely the Patello Bridge should be open with six lanes, not four lanes. And uh, also, as usual, this happened in our previous three surveys, the Massey project should be a bridge, not a tunnel, should be six lanes or even eight lanes to really anticipate for that 1.5 million people that are going to be moving into Metro Vancouver by 2050, and many of them are going to be moving into our South Fraser economic region. So we must prepare for future population growth, 
And in that survey, on that last page, are some other uh, high-level ideas to really instigate dialogue, uh, which includes uh, more road expansions, more transit investments, more mobility hubs, uh, really utilizing technology to ensure that we are able to move our people and move our goods. I encourage you to take a look at the full report. It's quite comprehensive on our website, and we're going to be utilizing it, as we always do, uh, each and every year in our conversations with government officials to instigate change. So thank you so much for listening, and uh, we're pleased to release the results of our 2020 Surrey Road Survey. that I wanted to mention is uh, we're so pleased, uh, even as a not-for-profit business organization, to be giving back to different uh, organizations that do such meaningful work in our city to enhance our livability. And, and they're giving back to other organizations as well. And so uh, at our last uh, Christmas sizzle that we had in December, our charity of choice for that event was to the Surrey Firefighters Charitable Association. And so on stage, I'm going to have our board chair, Doug Tennant, join me, along with, from the Surrey Firefighters Association, Dylan Van Ruyen and Aaron Sear for a check presentation in the amount of $3,000. to welcome back to Surrey, as I mentioned, uh, the Vice President for Research and Chief Economist at Business Development Bank of Canada. He leads a team of experts who analyze economic data to identify business and sector trends impacting Canadian entrepreneurs. He regularly travels across our great nation to help businesses understand the risk and opportunities presented by our economic environment. And I want to urge you, as you're listening to his presentation, to think about questions that you want to ask, and there will be a, a Q&A period afterwards. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage, Mr. Pierre Fabry. Since we are still at the beginning of the year, and I think you'll agree with me that there's a lot of uncertainty in the economy. It's, it's Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. So, uh, what I would like to do, I'm going to give you a perspective for the BC economy for the next uh, few years. In order to do that, I'm going to start with the world economy, because we have a very open economy. So what's going on around the world is really having an impact here. And I'm going to conclude the presentation by three factors, or three things that we should watch for for 2020. So first, the world economy. The world economy actually slowed down last year. Growth was, we're not in recession, we still have the growth. The growth was a bit less than 3% for the first time since the last recession. And the most important reason for that was the trade tensions around the world. The Brexit really had an impact on Europe. And of course, the trade tension between the US and China has caused the world economy to slow down. Business investment were down, the trade, international trade were down for the first time since the last recession. And as a result, commodity prices, which are important for Canada and for British Columbia, they were also declining. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. 
In response to this slowdown, 21 countries around the world have reduced their interest rate, including the U.S. That's the reason why mortgage rates went down, because our banks are financing themselves at the international level. So despite the fact that the interest rate didn't uh, decline in Canada, well, mortgage rates declined because the world has reduced interest rates. So as you can see, what's going on around the world is really having an impact here in Canada. The fact that 21 countries reduce interest rate, but it stimulated the economy. So this year, the world economy is going to actually grow a little faster than last year. We're going to be back to over 3%. But of course, the growth is going to be quite different from one region to another. Europe is still struggling. It's positive growth at 1.3%, but it's kind of modest growth. India is probably the emerging country that is performing the best. China is having difficulties with the tariff imposed by the U.S. Chinese exports to the U.S. last year dropped by 15%. As a result, the Chinese economy is not expected to grow as much as what we have experienced in the past. And of course, we all know, this is the beginning of the year, China is struggling with a new virus, the coronavirus. It's too slow to evaluate what would be the impact on the economy. Typically, when we look back in the past, those events doesn't have a lasting impact on the economy. It slowed down temporary the economy. That's what we expect for this year in China. But we don't expect that it's going to have a lasting impact on the growth of China. On one hand, the economy is slowing down because of the restriction. On the other hand, the Chinese economy, the government is spending billions of dollars to fight this virus. So at the end of the day, we don't expect to see a major impact on the economy. But like I said, it's a bit too soon to evaluate that. Finally, Japan, which is really close in terms of trade with China, is really having a tough time to grow because the Chinese economy has been slowing down. So the world economy <coughs> is improving, but the trade tensions has reduced to growth is really having an impact on commodity prices. But of course, the most important economy for us is the United States. Not only is it still the number one economy in the world, but 75% of our export in Canada are going south of the border. <coughs> in Colombia, it's 50%. We have a much more diversified export market, but still 50% of BC export is going to the United States. And the news is still good. Growth was really solid in 2018 when Mr. Trump reduced taxes massively. So that stimulated the economy. You can see it from the graph. You know, the tax reform has really accelerated the economy at 2.9% in 2018. But as the tax reform is phasing out, and also as the uncertainty with the trade issue with China increased, well, the economy came back around, uh, around close to 2%. Last year's growth is going to be 2.2% at the end of the year. This year we expect similar growth, but it's lower at 2%. There's basically two stories in the U.S. right now. The first one is consumers are very confident about the economy, and they're going to be the main engine of the growth in the U.S. On the other side, businesses are much more worried about the economy, and we're going to see that this is having a negative impact on the the reason why consumers or Americans are optimistic is this graph. The unemployment rate in the U.S. today is 3.5%. This is the lowest unemployment rate in the U.S. over the last 50 years. This is a very good news. Discourage workers, people who have been out of the job market for two or three years, they're coming back. There's enough job to hire people with low skills or with low experience. So not only this number is a great number for economists, but in reality, more Americans are working today than never before. So it's actually a good news for people. And also, as you can imagine, when you have a very tight uh, labor force, salaries are increasing. So more Americans are working, salaries are increasing, so they're confident. 
what consumer confident, what they do is they shop, they buy stuff. And it's exactly what we are seeing in the US right now. Consumption had increased last year by 2.6%, which is very significant, and we expect to see it continue this year. Also, people buy houses when they're confident about the economy. Housing start, as you can see, has been increasing every year since the last recession, but it's getting momentum now. It's increasing at the higher pace because the job market is good and also because interest rate slowed down or declined last year. This is good not only for the U.S., it's good for us because we sell lumber to the U.S. So when our thing starts increasing in the U.S., well, the demand for our lumber is actually increasing. That should help a little bit the forestry industry. So consumers are confident that they are going to be the driver of the U.S. economy. On the other side, businesses are much more worried because they have to deal with the 15 or 25 percent tariff imposed now by the U.S. to Chinese import. So, for example, if you're located in the U.S. and you import products from the U.S., you're going to pay 15 percent or even 25 percent tariff on your problem. You can imagine, you're business people, you can imagine how difficult this is. You cannot pass to your consumer 25 percent tariff. So you have to find other solutions. Other suppliers. But your business people, you know that you cannot find suppliers very easy. So it brings a lot of uncertainty in the business world in the US. So these tariffs opposed to Chinese import is actually bringing a lot of uncertainties in the business world in the U.S. As a result, business investment in the U.S. has declined for the first time since the last recession. As you know, Mr. Trump signed the, uh, a deal with China at the beginning of this year, about uh, three weeks ago. They call it the first one. And the reason why they did that is because it doesn't eliminate all the tactics but it does eliminate some of it. So it's a step in the right direction that doesn't solve the entire problem, but it's actually going to reduce the tension between the two countries. And also, by the way, the, uh, the US government just announced that we're going to withdraw the tariff on any medical products and device sent to China for the virus reason. So the point is that the tension still exists, it should actually improve in 2020. We believe that this is a best that are going to bounce back this year. And this is going to help the economy. So in conclusion, the U.S. continues to be strong. 2% growth this year, the economy is still running at full capacity, the unemployment rate is low. So the U.S. economy is going to be actually the driver of the world economy for 2020. So let's bring back to Canada. Before I talk about the province, I would give you one slide, about two slides about Canada, just to put this in perspective. The Canadian economy last year had modest growth, 1.6%, which is lower than the potential growth of Canada. And this year growth is going to be similar. The reason why growth is a bit lower in Canada is mostly because of the oil price. As you know, the oil price dropped significantly in 2018. It came back slowly last year but not very significantly. So business investment in the oil has been really slow. You can feel it here, British Columbia. But in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Newfoundland, you really feel it. And that's the reason why the Canadian economy is a bit lower. Growth is going to be quite different from one province to another. British Columbia is going to have the highest growth this year in 2020. Sorry, we Side joke. <laughs> uh, and it's going to be followed by Quebec for 2%, and Newfoundland is going to be at the end of the, of the problem. The good news is Newfoundland is not a, no longer in recession, which was the case last year. So there's no recession in Canada, but growth is a bit different from one region to, to, uh, to another. So British Columbia, I already said it, is going to have 2.2% growth this year, which is going to be the highest in Canada. However, if we look at this graph, you can see that growth is a bit lower than what we have experienced for the last five years. So why is that? 
But commodity prices went down. And this is having an impact on the province. As you know, the mining sector is an important sector. So when prices are going down, investment is a bit low. And one of the sectors that is the most affected is forestry, which is one of the <coughs> most important sectors in, uh, in, in the province. What you see now is the price of lumber, that's the international price, that we work with. As you can see, there was a huge increase up to 2018, and then a huge drop. This is really affecting the forestry sector in the province. We saw plant closing, people lost their jobs. The good news is, as the housing market is improving in the U.S., this is going to happen. Unfortunately, it's not going to be enough to turn around the sector. It's going to take some time before the sector rebounds, before the market rebounds, and we see growth again. So that's the reason why growth is a bit lower than what we saw in the past. On the other side, there's going to be a number of factors that is going to contribute to growth this year in the problem. Actually, there's four factors that is going to support the growth. One is the job market is still very good. Second is the housing market is coming back. Third, government is still spending money supporting the growth of the province. And finally, the most important factor is business investment are really increasing because of some major projects. So first, the labor market in BC is very good. 40, the unemployment rate now is 4.8%, which is the lowest we have seen in the province. So I'm also the lowest in Canada. So the job market is still working very well. As people are working, they are more optimistic than they are buying houses again. The graph that you see now is the historic for the path followed by the housing sales in the province. As you can see, we had a peak in 2016. <coughs> but since then, the housing market has been slowing down, has been actually declining more than slowing down. First, the introduction of the foreign tax really has <coughs> Impact. You can really see it on the graph. When the provincial government introduced the foreign tax, we really saw an impact on the housing market. Then in 2018, the federal government introduced a stress test across the country. And that also had an impact on the housing market. Actually, not only here. If I show you the graph in different provinces, we see exactly the same impact. So we have a huge decline in terms of the housing sales. However, it's coming back. Over the last six months, we see much more sales, and we believe 2020 is going to be a year that the housing market is going to come in back slowly, not like what we have experienced before. We don't expect prices to increase as much as before, but it's going to improve a little bit of what we have seen over the last two years. Two reasons for that, the job market is good, and also mortgage rates has been declining because interest rates around the world have that's explaining why the housing market is weak. Although sales decline, housing starts in the province didn't really decline over the last few years. They're still very strong, and we believe 2020 is going to be even a better year. So first, source of growth for the province is going to be the housing market that is in Second source of growth is business investment. The graph that you see now is the business investment in <coughs> the province, in, the, in British Columbia, every month. So every dot that you see, it's a monthly result. As you can see, business investment is exploding. It's really increasing rapidly. If you look back, business investment has been fluctuating between 400 million a month to 450. Now we're almost at 700. So what's going on? What happened? Well, these projects are happening. Two major projects are going to support the growth of the province for the next decade. The first one and the most important one is the LNG project. $40 billion over 10 years. This is a major project. It's increasing business investment by almost 20%. This is the largest industrial project ever done in Canada. So this is a great project. This is a project that is going to be done in the north part of the province. One is a pipeline, the other one is a plant in Kitimak. I was in Prince George over the last few days. 
And although Prince George is not exactly there, but it's, it's a hub, <coughs> it's, a it's a hub in the north, and they really feel the, the investment and the jobs that are created. This project is going to create 7,000 jobs in the next eight years. So the construction phase is going to be very labor intensive, and is going to require investment, 40 billion investment, a lot of technology, so companies across the province are going to benefit from that, even outside of the province. This is going to be the main reason of growth for the next few years. And of course, government spending continues to increase. You can agree or disagree with that. I'm not going to put the judgment. But as an economist, I definitely see that this is going to have a positive impact on the economy. So as a result, growth in 2020 is going to be 2.2%, the best growth in Canada supported by the coming back of the housing market, more government spending, but especially more business investment related to the LNG project. I'm going to conclude this presentation on three uh, trends or three factors that we're watching for. The first one is interest rate. As you know, interest rate didn't increase in Canada, or didn't move in Canada over the last 12 months. So what should we expect in 20? Well, we believe interest rates are going to stay at the same level. As I've shown before, the Canadian economy is not performing so well. You know, 1.6% growth is modest growth. So obviously there's no reason for the Bank of Canada to increase interest rates. Some economists call the bank to reduce interest rates. We don't believe it's going to happen because the job market, the unemployment rate in Canada is low. The economy is still growing, not at a very rapid pace, but it's still growing. Also, we believe, and this is my old opinion, that the Bank of Canada is really careful by reducing interest rate because our debt ratio in Canada is very high. The median debt ratio is at an historic high. So if you reduce interest rate, you encourage Canadians to spend a little bit more or to get more in debt. So I think they are very careful about that as well. So we believe interest rates are going to be stable this year. So they're, not, they're not going to move up or going down. They're going to be stable at the same level in Canada. We also believe it's going to be the same in the U.S. We believe the U.S. the U.S. reduced interest rate three times last year, but we believe this year they're going to stay at the same. Level. Second thing to watch for is the dollar. A lot of Canadian businesses they either export or import goods from outside, so the dollar is very important. The dollar is still low, 76 cents this morning. It actually has been low over the last three years. It varies between 75 and 78 cents. We believe the dollar is going to stay about at the same level. It's going to stay low. And there's two reasons why our dollar is, is keeping low. The first one is we compare to the U.S. And the U.S. economy is performing better than the Canadian economy. So this is putting pressure down on Canadian economy. Second, our dollar is related, correlated to the oil price. So when the oil price goes up, we export a lot of oil. So it brings our dollar higher. The opposite is also true. When the oil price goes down, it brings our dollar we believe the oil price is going to stay stable, probably on the low side. So this is not going to put pressure up on the Canadian dollar. So for those reasons, we believe that the Canadian dollar is going to be stable for the next year, for the next one. So one last question that I get very often is when is going to be the next recession? Or another way to phrase it, are we going to have a recession? So, we get this question so often, we decided to do a lot of research to understand how recession started. Because there's two reasons why people didn't talk about so much about the recession. The first one is, there's a lot of uncertainty around the world. <coughs> and the second reason is, we have been growing for 10 years. So a lot of people believe that business cycles, they actually last for 10 years. So, after 10 years of growth, we need a recession. And so, I'm going to give you the answer now, and I'll explain later. <laughs> we 
don't believe that we're going into a recession. We actually believe we're going to continue to have a period of growth. Growth is not going to be as high as what we have seen over the last five years, but we believe we're still in the period of growth for quite a while. And the reason, the reason for that is recessions just don't happen. You don't have a recession because you had a long period of growth. You always need a shock or a trigger. And that's what we find out when we look back over the last 40 years. The graph that you see is actually economic growth in Canada per quarter for the last 40 years. So each bar represents a quarter. So we look back and we look back at the last recession to see what happened. And the first thing we realize is while there was four recessions over the last 40 years, I know you're going to catch <laughs> four recessions in 40 years. Well, that's one in great day. But as you can see from the graph, it's not equal. And business cycles, they don't last 10 years. Sometimes they last five years, three years, sometimes 15 years. Australia has been growing for 20 years. So there's no rule. But there's always a shock. There's always a trigger. The first trigger on this graph 1981. Some people might remember the inflation rate in Canada was 12 percent, and control inflation, the Bank of Canada increased interest rate to 19 percent. Mortgage rate was 22, 24 percent. I know it's hard to believe today, especially for younger people, because interest rate was so low. But yes, Canadians pay up 24 percent mortgage rate in the past. So the good news is the control inflation. The bad news, as you can see from the graph, the recession was quite long. They created a massive recession. So first trigger is when you increase interest rate. This is slowing down the economy. And it did happen in 2007. Interest rate were 5%. That was not the reason, the reason of the recession, but it did slow down the economy. 1991 was the second recession in that period. And this time is because the world oil price increased very significantly in that period of world recession. I remember, anybody remember 2007? <laughs> I got myself <the> finally. <laughs> 2007, this recession came from the U.S. Housing bubble in the U.S. That created a financial crisis and then a world recession. Finally, in 2014, technically Canada was in recession for six months because the oil price dropped by 60%. We didn't feel it here in BC. But in Alberta, they were in recession for about a year. So the point I want to make, the first point, is you always need a trigger. Recession just don't happen because of uncertainty. You need something that will put your economy into a recession. So I can tell you, the economists are looking for the next shock. They're looking for the next trigger. That's what economists do right now. The first very guilty factor is often inflation. When inflation goes up, you have to force the central banks to increase interest rate. And that's the reason why we had such a recession in 1981. This is the inflation rate in Canada right now. As you can see, it's really stable. Even after 10 years of growth, we have no inflation. This is a very good news because it means that central banks don't have to increase interest rate. And that's exactly what we see now. Interest rate in Canada are stable, they're low. U.S. is the same. So the next recession is not going to come because we have to increase interest rate. But there's a number of risks in the economy. The first one is our debt ratio is very high in Canada. Second risk is oil. And third, is the uncertainty inside the The first one is there's no doubt that the consumer debt ratio in Canada is very high. Is it enough to create a recession? Well, we don't think so. But if while the interest rate has been increasing over the last year, it did have an impact on our economy. Consumption went down. The housing market, like in BC, you know this very well, slowed down quite a bit. But that didn't create a recession. Second, the oil price was responsible for two of the last four recessions. Is it going to be responsible for the next one? 
We don't think so for two reasons. First, there's no reason to believe that the oil price is going to collapse. The world economy continues to grow. The world demand for oil continues to grow. And the good news is the Canadian economy is more diversified today than over the last 20 years. So even if the oil price would go down, like it did in 2018, went down by 40 percent, that didn't create a recession in Canada. That really slowed down the economy in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, but Canada was sick. So finally, the biggest risk that we see is in the U.S. The trade tension between the U.S. and China had the power to reduce the world economy. So if this tension, if this crisis is going worse, this has the power to create a recession. The good news is this tension is a notch down right now. So Trump signed a partial deal with China, which is really reducing the tension. So we believe that this risk is lower today than the money. <coughs> so for all these reasons, we believe that the economy will continue to grow. Growth is going to be a little bit more slower than what we have experienced in the past. This is going to be the case for the world, for the U.S., for Canada, and also for British Columbia. But we believe that we're going to extend our growth for the next few years. So I'm going to stop here. Very open to questions. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. so much, Pierre, and I'm so glad to hear we're not uh, going to face a recession, uh, so I hope that predict prediction uh, does come true. So we do have time for questions. Uh, please indicate your name, your company name, at the microphone, as well as your question, please. Uh, so I'm just going to start off, as all of you are thinking. Um, so we are facing, not only in Surrey, but in all of Canada, uh, this uh, trend towards, uh, for example, Arona is being bought out by Lowe's, uh, Forever 21, you know, the big retail chain from the U.S., they're shutting down. They just can't make it economically viable. Uh, so do you think, um, you know, why is that happening, number one, and is that going to impact our economy, and really what are the opportunities, especially for small and medium-sized uh, businesses? Uh, what's happening is mostly the retail sector, and uh, the reason is online uh, business. This is, the economy is not slowing down, it's just people are not buying in the same way that 87% of Canadians are going online before they make a decision to buy something. doesn't mean they're going to buy online, but they are making the decision of buying online. So the retail sector has really a tough time to adjust to that, and that's basically what we are seeing. Now, even the very large companies, retails, they have, a, they have really trouble, like the Max, uh, Mars, the Macy's, really is restructuring everything because of the difficulty they have selling online. So you have one big player that is expanding Amazon. You have a lot of retailers who are struggling to adjust to this new reality. So what does it mean for small and mid-sized firm? Well, you have to find a way to be present. First of all, you have to be present online. You know, uh, there's only 40% of the businesses went over So it's amazing in this time, in these days, so first, you have to do business. You have to be <coughs> We also did a study that it doesn't matter how you sell. If you sell through Amazon or other platform, or you have your own transactional website, it doesn't make a difference in terms in term of your success. But you have to sell online as well, if you are, you know, depending on your business model. So it's very important to be online today, so people can see what you do research about what they're going to buy. So basically, that's what's happening in the business. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Hi. Lou, I'm Stephen Pettigrew. I'm a counselor with the City of Surf. I'm also the chair of the Environment Committee for Surf. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on the effects of climate change on uh, and federal and world economies. 
I know, so we just had another 25 year event just last week. So. Yeah. Uh, th there's no doubt that we're going to see more <coughs> impact on climate change. Uh, like one of the best examples is forestry, which is an important sector in the province, it's an important sector in Canada. The fires that we have more often is really having an impact on the supply side of the sector. So this is a good example of how climate change is changing our economy. Uh, on the other side, uh, on the positive side, we have more lobsters than ever before. Because the, the water is getting warmer. Lobsters are moving from Maine to, uh, to New Brunswick and the West Coast. And we have more lobsters than cell phones. It might be because of Mr. Trump, but apparently it's because of the weather. <laughs> My point is, some sectors are going to benefit from that. Some sectors are going to be, uh, be negatively impacted on that. We have more flood, we have more fires, uh, we have more events than before. And more, uh, most forecasters believe that we're going, it's going just to accelerate. So at BDC, we take this very seriously. And we are doing a research right now that is going to be released in about six weeks about how small and mid-sized firm, what are the actions they're taking to reduce the footprint? I'm not going to give you the result today, but I can tell you that I was surprised how many thousands of small and mid-sized firms are taking action to reduce their waste, to reduce their footprint, even to have a uh, equal design problem. So this is very encouraging. Everybody has to do something to make sure that uh, we, we uh, limit the impact of climate change. But watch for this report from BDC on small business because you will see that it's the transformation is already there. It's already happening. Other questions? Yes. Patrick Montander, the big picture coach. Uh, Opus uh, Venture Capital Group. And it's one of the slides you put up um, showed the investment in non-residential construction. Did that reference British Columbia or all of Canada? British Columbia. Okay. By the way, I saw a documentary on lobsters. Uh, apparently, <laughs> apparently, a lot of them make lobsters. Uh, selling them to Canadian lobsters. Board of Trade events where you can engage with the speaker live. <laughs> Great value. Um, James Stewart at the law firm of Hamilton Duncan. You said that uh, consumer confidence is up. You've also said that uh, consumer debt is at historic levels. Doesn't this reveal a, a fundamental weakness? Because it seems that the com confidence is encouraging people to spend money they don't have. And uh, doesn't that um, create Pending liability or pending risk in the future that has to be dealt with somehow, and how would you deal with that? Um, that's a great uh, question. Um, we had low interest rate for a long time, so that really encouraged people to spend money, and we had a good job market for a long time as well. So people have jobs, uh, interest rate are low, 
So people have been spending more, they have been growing a lot of money. I should say that uh, most of our uh, debt is related to mortgage. So it's not like Canadian has wasted money, it's just because housing sales has been really increasing. And actually, you see it from my province, the highest <coughs> debt ratio. This is not going to surprise you. Where do you think it is? The lowest? Uh, Nova Scotia, in the East Coast. The East Coast. And it's not because the Nova Scotia people are, you know, more conservative, it's just because the price of housing is much lower. So, having said that, it's still a risk, and it's still uh, something that uh, everybody is trying to slow down. The, the, the government tried two things, right? First, the stress test. The stress test was introduced to prevent higher debt in Canada, but actually helping Canadians to protect themselves against, against themselves. So the stress test is when you have a mortgage, when you apply for a mortgage, you have to demonstrate not only you can pay your mortgage, but you can also pay your mortgage if interest rates are increasing by two uh, percentage points. So that was one action. The fact that the Bank of Canada is not for lowering the interest rate, I think it's the second action that they're taking to try to limit the growth of debt. So uh, beside that, there's not much the government can do. Uh, hopefully, uh, like what we're saying now is the level of debt is plateauing. It's not increasing as much as in the past, but it's still a very large amount of debt. What we believe is this is not going to be a trigger for the next recession, but if we have a recession, let's say coming from the U.S. or coming from the world, this is going to be a tougher recession this time than in 2007 in Canada because of our debt ratio is very high. As long as you have a job, you can pay more. The problem becomes if there's a world recession and people are losing their job, it's becoming very, very difficult. So that's why it's one of the biggest risks we have. Yes. Bank. Question is related to your, uh, recently the bank decreased its prime rate, the posted rate, sorry, not the prime rate, sorry, it's posted rate is pre bank. I'm sure the top other five banks are going to follow the suit. Does this mean an indication of coming relaxation in stress test or something? If, if it's an indication to. Of relaxation in stress test down the line? Um. I think it's more, uh, like it's a, what's happening is even interest rate has been stable in Canada. Interest rate has been going down at the world level. And the banks in Canada, they find themselves on the international market. So they are able to offer lower mortgage rate because of that. And you know, when interest rates are going to increase, they are going to go in this other uh, direction. The criteria for the stress test has been a bit released because of that. But they still exist. So the federal government still maintains this because they believe that it's a way to limit how much debt you can get. And you saw on the graph, it really had an impact on real estate. Some Canadians couldn't buy houses because of the stress test, which on one hand you can say that's really negative, but on the other hand, maybe we protected some Canadians from being too much in so that's the idea. So the stress test, I think, is going to stay there. The criteria has been, has been eased over the last 12 months, but the, the, the stress test is still there. Next question. Thank you. Great cancellation of uh, what's going to be happening. I'd like to know, as we go ahead, looking at the 2.2% uh, growth rate, I mean, compared to India and China, it's pretty low. Um, compared to the United States, we're about on par. How do you explain in layman's terms how the stock market and our stocks and bonds are surging ahead compared to um, the growth rate that we're experiencing from a bottom line? Well, uh, there's not always a connection between the stock market and the economy. Uh, the stock market is a lot of perception. It's a lot of uh, 
good example of that is the price of the Tesla stock, which is really based on perception, not on reality. But it's really uh, not something we check. It. It's values are very innovative. Well, actually, they are not as innovative as in 2007 before the last recession. So they are still in a reasonable zone. Having said that, and they, they reflect the fact that the economy is strong, uh, U.S. companies are performing very well, and that the stock market reflects that. Personally, I believe that we are going to have few corrections, even if the economy performs well, because that's the nature of the stock market. When value are becoming too high, you are close to a correction. I don't know when, and it doesn't mean that the economy is going to go into a recession, but value are so limited that we should expect a correction. Just a last question that I had for you, uh, kind of contentious, uh, is uh, what's good for Canada's economy? A Republican win or a Democrat win? <laughs> um, that's a great question. Uh, <clears throat> I think it would be, it, it's, it's, more, like, it's more stable present. It doesn't matter, uh, Republican or Democrat. The big issue for Canada was the free trade agreement. And they have rectified it, they have signed it, so it's done. The problem with Mr. Trump is his managing tariff has a policy. This is new. Like in the past, you know, and no country will impose tariff just to uh, give a signal to another country. Because when you impose a tariff, you change the dynamic of a sector of the economy. So Mr. Trump has been very good over the last four years to impose a number of tariffs and to live that after. So a living in um, uh, steel Canada, lumber that is still there, a number of tariffs on Mexico, on the Mexico side. So the best case scenario for Canada is to have a president that is a bit more stable in this situation. <laughs> Because you need, you need to relieve the uncertainty that we have. And a lot of uh, this uncertainty is uh, for nothing. I mean, the U.S. economy is performing very well, the unemployment rate is at, it's very low. So there's no reason to impose tariffs. There's no reason to, uh, to have this uncertainty. But China is a bit different, I have to, to say. Um, the issue with China is the U.S. trade deficit with China went from zero to $500 billion in 15 years. So for example, this year, the US is buying for $500 billion more from China than the US is having. So there's actually a good reason to impose tariffs on China to say you should open your market. You know, China has been very good to sell around the world. They haven't been as good to open the market to foreign uh, businesses. And by the way, the situation is the same for Canada. We have a huge deficit with, with China, not as big as the US because we're a much smaller economy. But the issue is the same for France, for Germany, for UK, for Canada, for the US. And in the past, Mr. Uh, Obama was negotiating behind closed doors. He was telling the president of China that you should open your market. You sell to the US. Our American companies have a tough time to do that. As you know, Mr. Trump has a different strategy. <laughs> he has a much more visible strategy. Is he going to win? That's a good question. But actually, the uh, issue is a real one. Because they have a huge trade deficit, which is literally growing. And definitely, you know, for our local Surrey lumber companies, and even for our Canadian forest companies, we're waiting for that softwood lumber agreement to be renegotiated and finalized to give certainty to those businesses. Yeah. Because we still have a 20.2% tariff on the yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for the <laughs> Conclusion, some final Surrey Board of Trade events. Uh, they're all at businessinsurrey.com. Uh, we are just organizing our post-budget uh, speech event uh, with the Premier, the date to be announced. 
and uh, you'll hear that in the next couple of days. Uh, so that will happen in mid-February. Later this month is our Surrey Hot Topic Dialogue on Surrey's police transition. Uh, we have a business networking reception at the technology reception in the Cloverdale area of Surrey at F12 Net. And on the end of February, we're also focusing on LNG, mining, and forestry with the CEOs of each of those associations. And the BC Chamber of Commerce will also be presenting their findings on the importance of the natural resource sector to driving jobs, driving the economy, not only for Surrey, but also for all of British Columbia. And uh, of course, the highly anticipated Surrey Women in Business Awards event uh, is on March the 12th with, with uh, Erin Brockovich. It is sold out, uh, but we are keeping a wait list. It's uh, going to be very exciting uh, as we uh, recognize great female entrepreneurs uh, in our city. Ladies and gentlemen, make it a great business day. Thank you.